This is not full screen, I think. Okay, so then wait a second. Um, swap. And now? Not, yeah, now it's full screen. Yeah, thank Good. you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no problems. This is yeah. always a random Maybe. choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have, we have two minutes. So let yeah, me introduce yeah. you first. Yeah. So mm -hmm. our next speaker is Professor Martin Plenio. And Professor Martin Plenio is Alexander von Humboldt Professor and Director of the Institute of Theoretical Physics and of the Center for Quantum Bioscience and leads the Controlled Quantum Dynamics Group at Alm University. His research interests are in quantum technologies, quantum information science, and quantum biologies. Uh, and in particular, Martin Plenio is a very famous theoretical physicist uh and in particular when i started working in around 1999 then i used to see so many papers especially on mm -hmm. relative entropy of entanglement uh written by professor plenio Beddal, and other co-authors mm -hmm. uh so his interest his vast areas of interest consist of quantum technology quantum information science quantum metrology quantum biology that i told all the quantum statistical mechanics and quantum many body physics. So I think, yeah, we can start. Okay, <laughs> over to Professor Plenio. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so today um, I will not talk so much only about the information theory, but I'm also trying to apply it actually um, to testing low energy aspects of, of gravity in the laboratory. So this, will this talk will have some practical aspects, some discussion about um, what can and can, can go wrong and what uh, may not go wrong in these schemes. But also then uh, in the second part of the talk, I will connect it actually to information theoretical questions and um, really hard information theory. Okay, so let's get started. So what is this uh, whole talk going to be about? And um, so you, you may know that um, almost all the forces in nature, like electromagnetism uh, as the particular example, strong force, weak force, and all these, these forces, we have already verified that they are uh, quantum mechanical forces, um, by which, for example, we mean that they can entangle things. Um, the one force that we don't know this, strictly speaking, is gravity. And this is because it is really very weak. And uh, this is uh, particularly troublesome because unlike all the other forces, gravity has not been unified uh, with, uh, with, with quantum mechanics and uh, there is no theory, no widely accepted theory of quantum gravity. Um, and, and from an experimental point of view, the reason for this problem, problem is that gravity is so weak. And from a theoretical point of view, it's, it's just that the structures of uh, the gra theory of gravitation and uh, quantum theory are really rather different. And it's not so evident how we uh, actually can combine them. And this is not a new question at all. Uh, in fact, um, already in the early days of, relatively early days of quantum mechanics, um, uh, uh, people have started to wonder how can we formulate a theory of quantum gravity? And, and people had problems. And, and so in, they also started to discuss, do we actually need to quantize gravity? And uh, this happened, for example, in, in, a, in the Chapel Hill Conference in 1957, which was uh, about the role of gravitation in physics. And uh, there was indeed a discussion um, whether it might not be just possible to, to leave gravity classical as it is and, and have some quantum mechanics for, for massive uh, bodies. And so there was a lengthy discussion about that. And one of the participants in the discussion was Richard Feynman. And uh, he actually chose um, a particular example, a thought experiment um, to, to maybe highlight where might be a problem, where there might be a problem. And so he thought, uh, uh, in essence, he thought of the following, he gave a slightly longer explanation, but um, uh, in essence, he was thinking about a small uh, a, a ball, which is a, a massive object, and that he would actually, by some means, would place this 
in superposition. And so there would be a spatial superposition of the mass being displaced up or down. And then he considered that there would be somewhere nearby a test body, also a massive particle. And by some miracle, um, or not miracle, but by extremely careful experimental design, um, the experimentalist would make sure that the only forces that would be acting between those two bodies would be gravity. Anything else would have been uh, removed. And then the question is, what will happen? Because uh, now we have this ball in super spatial superposition. And well, what we will expect is that the upper, the upper, um, ball, the upper part of the superposition will pull this test body upwards. The lower part will pull it downwards. And so we would end up with a state of this form, which um, would be a coherent superposition of both balls being displaced upwards and both balls being, being displaced downwards. And um, at the time, he didn't call it like that, but uh, in today's parlance, uh, this would be an entangled state. And that um, is rather a different state compared to um, a classical a mixture of the two particles either being displaced up or being down, displaced down. So in one case, we would have classical correlations only. And in the case where we have an entangled state, we have quantum correlations. And we certainly know nowadays, and Feynman knew at the time also, that these two states would be rather different and would actually lead to observable differences in experiments. And therefore, um, he said that if we believe that uh, gravity is quantum mechanical, we will get a disentangled state. If we do not believe it's uh, quantum mechanical, then we will end up with a classically correlated state. And that would give very big differences in experiments. So that would be was perhaps the first experimental test that was suggested uh, on how to determine whether um, gravity is a quantum mechanical force or not. Now, um, this has lain, laid, laid dormant uh, for quite a while. Um, and, and more recently, um, uh, quantum information scientists have picked up on this again and repeated uh, basically this, this train of thought and um, uh, formulated it in the quantum information language and, and really basically made a definition. And they now said, we consider the gravitational interaction classical if it cannot entangle particles, or more generally, if it does not allow us to create a coherent quantum channel. Yeah. And um, now, now we can think, OK, why don't we just do this experiment? And you have to remember that certainly in the times of Feynman in 1957, what he proposed was really almost beyond crazy. Uh, in experimental terms, because it's not so, in, in those days in 1952, for example, Schrodinger made this famous statement that, um, that we really don't, uh, sometimes as theorists, we might consider thinking about experiments with single atoms, and this invariably entails some ridiculous consequences, but in, in reality, we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise dinosaurs in the zoo. And so really, even thinking about an experiment with a single atom in 1952 was really inconceivable with the technology of the day. And then doing an experiment, as Feynman had suggested, taking massive bodies containing millions of atoms, placing them in coherent superposition of their spatial degrees of freedom, and let them interact with a very weak force of gravity was just um, un inconceivable. But nowadays, actually, the situation has changed. In 70 years, humanity has worked to improve our control of quantum uh, systems. And nowadays, we can place many, many um, types of massive systems in coherent superpositions. We can cool them near the ground state um, of their uh, position degree of freedom. And that this is shown in this graph here. So you have here oscillators of different masses 
So that means here on the left hand side, that's a single electron. And then here, these ones, they, those are um, atoms. And then all the way through to actually masses that weigh kilos. And those would be, in that case, would be the mirrors um, in, the, in the LIGO, uh, for example. And over time, people have started with these systems um, with a very large number of uh, phonons. So in the, the emotional degree of freedom was still quite warm and very classical. We're talking about millions or billions of phonons. But then in 95, for example, atoms were cooled to the emotional ground state. And later on, first molecules were cooled to the ground state. Cold, uh, cold atoms were uh, created, both ions and condensates. And actually, in, in, 19, in 2021, um, very heavy mirrors, 20 kilo heavy mirrors, the, the relative motion of, two, of a pair of such, such mirrors was cooled to around 10 phonons, so very close to the emotional ground state. So nowadays, this, this idea of cooling massive bodies to the ground state and, and dealing with them and placing in superposition is still extremely difficult, but it's not crazy anymore. Um, and so therefore, we can now start to really think of taking Feynman's idea of doing such an experiment and turning it into a reality. It might still take another 10 or 20 years to do it, but now we can really see that this is a feasible experiment. And indeed, the reason for that is also uh, the reason is this is also the reason that um, you know a lot of people are starting to think about this. I mean, the, the first um, uh, paper that I could find that made it very explicit was by uh, Asha Peres, actually, um, who is of course one of the pioneers of quantum information. He actually was thinking of how to. Uh, entangle atoms with both Einstein condensates using gravity. And there were many more and more uh, papers that are now starting to think up more and more realistic uh, types of experiments. So let me talk a little bit about how you would fashion this experiment and how you would get a, re a reasonable sensitivity for um, measuring gravitational force. So one way um, of doing this is, would be essentially Feynman's uh, uh, way. Um, where you take two particles um, that are shown here, left particle and right particle, and we place each one of these particles in a spatial superposition. And by doing this, um, we create uh, in phase space uh, for each of these particles, uh, Schrodinger cat. So we would have uh, one part of the superposition here, one part of the superposition here, and we would have very narrow interference fringes in between. And the periodicity of these interference fringes will be actually inversely proportional to the distance between the two parts of the uh, superposition. So that's uh, one way of going about this. And the other way would be actually to take these particles and rather than placing them into a Schrodinger cat state, we could squeeze each of these particles and thereby reduce the uncertainty in one direction, so for example, in momentum direction, very, very much at the expense of increasing um, the uncertainty in a different direction. And in a sense, this is um, also, again, making a large spatial delocalization in order to achieve in phase space a very narrow feature in momentum direction. So this is happening here. So here would be momentum direction, here would be spatial direction. And so you can see that these two schemes are sort of similar in the sense that we try and either here we create um, oscillatory features with very high, with very narrow features. And here we create a Gaussian, which in one direction is very narrow. And in both cases, I would like to show you now that um, you get a very high uh, force sensitivity. And in fact, these two schemes, although they look very, very different, they are actually absolutely um, equivalent in terms of measurement sensitivity. So what will happen um, in the first scheme? In the first scheme, it's typically envisioned to have the following. You have your one particle here placed in superposition. And now let's look at um, the other particle, one part of this wave function, so the left part. 
So th that will now induce a gravitational potential on these two particles, and it will have certain uh, gradient. And that means that now under the action of this uh, gravitational force of this particle, this part of the wave function and that part of the wave function will pick up a slightly different phase because the potential is different. And so there will be a relative phase between this particle and that particle developing. And that's exactly what you are, what I've written here. So we will, when the particle on the, when the school position, uh, so when the first particle is on more to the left, then we'll get a certain relative phase. Um, and now, if we think of this particle here actually being displaced to the right, then it's a bit closer to the superposition. The uh, potential gradient is steeper, and therefore we get a different uh, relative phase. And so now we, if we have a superposition of the two, then if the particles on the left, we get one phase, the particles on the right, we get a different phase. And so these two phases, if they are really different, then after a sufficiently long time, we will actually see that this state and that state are orthogonal, and therefore we get a lot of entanglement. We will get a full unit of entanglement. And so that's actually one way of then measuring the, the action of the gravitational force. We look for the entanglement between these two particles. And here we do it, it seems by just picking a relative, looking at a relative phase. And that is quite natural to think of it like that, because if you want to do precision measurements in science, often what we do is we try and translate the measurement, the observable that we, the, the, or the, the, the quantity that we want to measure into a phase change, because in experiments, what we can control very well are phases and relative phases. So now, this is not what Feynman thought ex explicitly. I mean, he thought of a displacement of particles, so rather different. And it seems initially that this is really not a clever way of doing things because displacements seem to be things that, well, they're not relative phases, so they're much harder to measure. So let's have a look again. So, sorry, this is, should not be in there. So let's think again now, but now about the squeezed states that we have. So we provide a state that is very strongly delocalized in position and very, very narrow, very small uncertainty in momentum. And for simplicity, let me argue again that we, uh, the other particle here is in a coherent superposition of the particle being on the left or on the right hand side. So what will happen if this particle is a bit farther away, then it pulls less strongly on, on the particle B and therefore it will be accelerated less and therefore it suffers less uh, of a momentum displacement. If we are on the right hand side of the superposition, then we are closer to the particle, we exert a stronger force, therefore we exert uh, a larger change in momentum. And so this is exactly what we will see here. We are on the left hand side, we get one displacement, if we are the first particle is on the right hand side, we get a stronger displacement. And now we can see what will be the condition that we will get strong entanglement here. Well, the two displaced states have to be orthogonal on each other. That means they have to be displaced by an, in a momentum direction by a an amount that is larger than the uncertainty in momentum in that state. In that case, we will get um, also an entangled state. And so now the question is, which of these schemes will actually be more sensitive. And um, to see this, to study this a bit more, um, now let's have a look um, at the, what is happening here in phase space. So here on the left-hand side, I have a, a situation now where I change, I have a Schrodinger cat state, and I change the relative phase between the left-hand side of the Schrodinger cat and the right-hand side of the Schrodinger cat. And what, when you do the calculation, what this will do is that it will actually change the phase of the interference pattern in between the two parts of the superposition. So near the origin, there are these, in these oscillatory features and they shift in phase space, okay? And so when we change the phase, you can see that this uh, actually really is moving upwards. Okay, so that's uh, one thing that is happening. Now, if we make a displacement of the same Schrodinger cat state, now in momentum space, so we displace 
pace it upwards, we accelerate it, so we give it momentum, then we see that something similar seems to happen. So there is the interference pattern. It seems to be displaced now in phase space. And we have here the Schrodinger, the, the, the left and right hand side of the Schrodinger cat. They will also be displaced. Hand side, displacement, left hand side, relative phase. So how do they relate to each other? So let's have a look by showing both of them. And now you see that under exactly the same force, what you will see is on the right hand side, you have displacement, left hand side, you have the relative phase change. But when you look at the interference pattern, you will see that in both cases, they move up in actually exactly the same way. So actually looking at displacement of the Schrodinger cat or looking at um, just the relative phase being changed is absolutely the same. Yeah? So the most important part, namely the change of the interference pattern in the center is exactly the same. And why is this, this helpful? Because if you change um, so if you change the interference pattern here in the center and you shift it by half a period, then you will see that what was before a maximum is now a minimum and actually it is negative. And when you compute now the overlap of this displaced interference pattern at the, 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 the cat state with the displaced phase with the original cat, then you will see that the blobs here the, the left and the right hand uh, displaced coherent states of the Schrodinger cat, they will give a positive contribution. And the central part here will actually give a negative contribution because wherever the displaced part is positive, the undisplaced part is negative. And therefore you will actually, by destructive interference, you will see that the part, the, the, con the positive contribution from the uh, displaced coherent states will be exactly eliminated by the displaced, um, by the interference pattern. And therefore the overlap will very rarely displace it by one width, one uh, by, the, by more than its width, then it becomes orthogonal. So therefore in both cases, what really is crucial here is that we have a large displacement in space, which allows us to create in the case of the squeeze state, a very small, variation in momentum. And in the Schrodinger cat state, the large displacement, the localization in position allows us to give a very a very high frequency um, so interference pattern in momentum direction. Me, can yes. Can you use your yes, oh. Uh. Ah, okay, so that's better. Okay, um, right. So in that sense, both schemes using coherence uh, using a Schrodinger cat state or using the squeeze state really give the same uh, precision. And uh, that's nice because in for many points of view, dealing with squeeze states is actually much easier experimentally. In fact, it is in, in meta wave optics, it is very easy near the ground state. And now what we'll do is we suddenly relax this potential um, um, so that it is weaker. And now in the new potential, this is what was the coherent ground state uh, initially. Now, actually in the new coordinates is uh, a squeezed state. That means it has a slightly smaller variance in position uh, than the ground state of this new potential and the slightly higher uh, uncertainty in momentum compared to the ground state of this new potential. So now we wait a quarter of a period to let this, uh, or this state rotate in phase space. And then we suddenly make the potential tighter again. And as a result, now in this new potential, the state that we have now is yet more squeezed in a momentum direction and even more delocalized in position uh, direction. And so if we repeat this periodically, what we can actually do is that every time we have a sequence of tightening the potential and relaxing it again, and we do this exactly for quarter periods, then we increase the squeezing by a factor that is proportional to the ratio of omega two divided by omega one. So the eigenfrequencies in the uh, release potential and in the tighter potential. And so we just need to 
do this periodically 10, 20 times, 30 times, and let's say if omega-2 and omega-1 are differing by a factor of two, repeating this 20 times, we actually create a state whose uncertainty in momentum direction is two to the 20 times smaller than the initial state. And so therefore, in a very easy way, we can get a very strong squeezed state. And we can then use this on um, two particles that are trapped in harmonic potentials. We are periodically modulating those potentials, create very large squeezing. And then when the squeezing is large enough, then even the weak interaction due to gravity will lead to strong entanglement between those two particles. And that's uh, what you can see here. So that would be the setting. We periodically uh, modulate the potentials. And what we will see then is that initially the entanglement does not grow very much because the uncertainty is still too large in place. But then when we have modulated often enough and the squeezing is so small that in a short time, we can displace the particle due to gravitational force by more than the uncertainty of the state, then entanglement grows. And that's what you see here then in this plot, no entanglement, then it rapid, rapidly grows. And then depending on what you, how you continue the protocol, it either stays constant or it is uh, reduced again. And so in this way, this might be a scheme where now you can actually do within maybe a few hundred milliseconds a measurement of the gravitational force and the displacement that it creates and the entanglement that gener is generated by it. So that's great. So that looks very promising. But the problem, of course, here is that um, this was an idealized setting. There was no noise, there was no imperfections. And so we really have to think about what happens in such protocols when there is a realistic amount of noise in the system will lead to a random acceleration of the particles. And so any noise source can actually be uh, quantified in terms of a random acceleration. And um, now you see here, the black curve is uh, what you get when you, when you have um, a very, uh, if you have a noiseless system. And then the blue curve is the, is the result that you get when you have a random acceleration that is 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared. So well, everything looks still pretty good, but then you see if you just increase this ac random acceleration a little bit to let's say seven times 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared, then already you decrease the amount of entanglement that you can get at best by a factor of 100. And so that looks pretty uh, bad, but I mean, at the moment, I would say for you, it's not clear whether 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared is a large acceleration or a small acceleration. So let's put this a little bit into perspective. So imagine we do our experiment, we have these two masses, and um, we um, put one of these masses happens to be not electrically neutral. So it has one excess electron on it, a single one. And um, let's uh, assume that um, at a distance of 20 meters from the experiment, there's another excess electron sitting, or let's say it's coming into being and, and it's let's say the charge is fluctuating by one uh, electron charge at a distance of 20 meters. On a body of one micron diameter, this will give a random acceleration of about six times 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared. If, um, let's go to a, a different um, part, if you, let's say, if you have a diamagnetic particle and it's sitting in a 0.1 Tesla magnetic field and a random magnetic field gradient comes into existence at of 10 to the minus 12 Tesla per meter, that gives eight times 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared acceleration. Or if there's a mass fluctuation, one kilometer from your experiment, um, then this mass will exert a gravitational force, which leads to an acceleration of six times 10 to the minus 17 meters per second squared. So this kind of shows you that even the tiniest imperfections in the experiment will lead to accelerations that are so large that actually they will create a noise that destroys observable entanglement in the experiment. So you will certainly have to 
be very, very careful and clean up your experiment to a large degree. And you will also need to develop strategies that make your system robust to noise, while at the same time retaining its sensitivity to the desired signal, which here is the gravitational interaction between the two masses that you would like to um, do experiments on. Okay, so this is um, really an extremely challenging uh, measurement setup that you have to realize. So let me give you just one simple example of what you could do actually to try and improve an experiment. So a typical experiment would go like using, again, trying to build a Schrodinger cat state. So we start with your, um, with your particle in the ground state. Then you apply, let's say, you have an internal spin degree of freedom. You put this into superposition. You place the particle in, in the magnetic field gradient. And what will happen is that it will actually be spatially separated. And then normally the experiment would be that then you would um, allow them to the particles to reunite again. And then you would have made some kind of Schrodinger cat state that uh, you could undo at the end and you can make interference experiments and by interference experiments you can actually measure relative phases that may have built up in the system. So the interference pattern here, for example, will depend on whether this part, this superposition will become entangled with some other um, mass some distance away. Now the problem is that of course this super kind of superposition will actually um, deface very rapidly if there is a random force or random acceleration applied to these particles here because then they move in the gravity in the magnetic field in the magnetic field gradient they pick up therefore a random phase and that accelerate that uh, that randomizes things so what can you do to prevent this well you could actually try and symmetrize the paths that are taken so he here again, so we have the first step already, we have created the superposition. Now I can flip the spins and I allow them to move again in the magnetic field gradient. And now they move um, into uh, from the left side to the right side and vice versa. And we can repeat this and we can repeat this. And now we can see that in this way, we symmetrize the part, parts in the sense that the particles are half the time on the left hand side and half the time on the right hand side. So that means if there's some force that tries to um, distinguish left and right hand side by placing, for example, a magnetic field, uh, some gradient or so, then this force is averaged out. And therefore, we are actually able to remove slow disturbing forces from external sources. So for example, when the particle is very far away and it's fluctuating or the atmosphere is changing its density a little bit, these are typically rather slow changes. And those we can average out here because they lead to um, relative phases between the left and the right hand side. And if we make the path symmetric, then these are averaged out. And now you can go through the study carefully and you will see that indeed, you can use these kind of tricks and you can actually symmetrize the paths, but this will only average out the noise from very distant sources. And it will not actually average out the gravitational interaction between two such interferometers that are close to each other, that are maybe only a millimeter or a few hundred microns apart from each other. Okay. And so that is something that you can check very, very easily. Um, because the, the first order in the interactions, but we can still preserve the interaction between two close by particles. So that's certainly one way of going about these things. And the nice thing is that in precision measurement and in sensing technologies, people have developed a whole lot of tricks and methods how to modulate um, the dynamics of a system in such a fashion that it averages out noise while retaining sensitivity to a very specific signal. And certainly it's worthwhile to look into this literature, trying to understand what they're doing and then translate these tricks to these kind of um, um, gravitational experiments. And that's exactly what we have done here in this paper and then also in a few other. But another thing that one would really would like to do is one would like to accelerate experiments because no matter how well they are uh, insulated, the faster the experiment, 
the less time the noise has to build up, um, to destroy uh, your uh, coherence and therefore destroy the gravitational signal. And so let's have a look at how typically these experiments look like again. So here we have some test mass, here we have some test mass. They are very light. They will interact with each other gravitationally over a certain distance, a few hundred microns or so. And over a few hundred microns, gravitational interaction is really very weak. And it's basically proportional to the mass of this body times the mass of that body. And typically in the experiment nowadays, we can, we can only control cool to the ground set masses that are maybe of 10 to the minus 17 kilos or so. And that makes for extremely small gravitational interactions. So why not try and enhance this interaction? And one thing could be, why not place a heavy mass in between some object that is many, many times heavier, maybe let's say a kilo, then this body here will interact now very strongly gravitationally with this body because the gravitational interaction is the mass of this is proportional to the mass of this body times the mass of that body. And now that is of course a lot larger than the direct interaction between these two light test masses. So now there's the hope that we have here a strong gravitational interaction we have here a strong gravitational interaction. And now we can try and we can hope that in effect, this particle and this particle become entangled much more rapidly uh, via this heavy particle in between as compared to their direct interactions. So that was the hope. And uh, initially we tried for almost a year playing with parameters and it just didn't work. And the problem was that we had to place, we had to make this mass so heavy that this gravitational interaction here was so strong that actually it made the particle unstable in its potential. So it was pulling so strong that it was actually really drawn out of the potential and, and, and then the, the, the experiment would not be mechanically stable, it wouldn't work. Um, but then at some point we started to think, okay, let's turn this back into a feature and let's go to a slightly more complicated situation. Let's take actually a double well potential where indeed the particle is not stable when it's sitting here, but it would be stable when it's either sitting on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And so if we have this um, double well potential, then we have here two near degenerate states that are uh, superpositions of being on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And this forms an effective qubit, and this will interact with the central mass, and the central mass will interact with this particle. So again, this is still not good enough because we still don't have a very strong interaction. And it turns out that the best thing that we could do is we keep one of the interactions here gravitational, and the other interaction actually we can make non-gravitational, for example, electromagnetic. So the Casimir force, for example. By moving this potential, this particle here quite close to the heavy mass, we will get very strong Casimir forces. And now we are interested in the, still interested in the entanglement of this particle here with that one. And if gravity would be classical, there would still be no entanglement between this particle and that particle, because this mediating interaction then would be classical. Okay, so this experiment will still test for the quantumness of the interaction between this particle and the heavy mass, and therefore between this particle and this other test mass. Okay, and so now we had to go through uh, calculations and we found something really quite interesting. Namely, we got entanglement between this particle and that particle, even if this heavy mass here was not cooled to the ground state, but was in a thermal state. So that is um, what we see here. And this is a trick that we took from ion trap physics, actually, um, where if you have these three particles, there are specific moments in time where the light masses become uncorrelated actually did they come in did they will be in a product state with the heavy mass in intermediate times all the three particles will be entangled with each other but at specific moments in time they uh, the light mass has become decorrelated from the heavy mass 
but they will actually be entangled with each other. And so this is actually an analytical solution of this problem. So you will have here some term that actually entangles the light masses with the motion of the heavy mass. And here, there is a direct effective interaction between the two light masses. And you have here a factor alpha of t, and that is an oscillatory function in time. And if uh, the frequency multiplied with time is equal to 2 pi, then this factor here is 0. And so therefore, this fact prefactor vanishes, and the particles only become entangled with each other, the light masses, while the heavy mass drops out of the game. And so that's exactly what you see here. For certain times, you look at the entanglement between the two light masses, and you will see there's nothing, 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 nothing. And then it jumps up, and then it falls down again after a while. It goes up and falls down again after a while. And so if at these moments, at these specific magic moments, we do the measurement, then we actually look only at the entanglement between these two particles. And the rate at which this entanglement is generated is actually proportional to the weak gravitational interaction between the light test mass and the heavy mass, multiplied with a strong interaction between the other test mass and the um, heavy mass, divided by the frequency of oscillation of the heavy mass. And now, of course, one has to have a look. OK, how much entanglement do we, do we get? And in particular, can we get a gain compared to an experiment where we would not have this heavy mass in between? And that is now a lengthy analysis. And what we actually find in the end that the, the relative phases that are being picked up, and so therefore the amount of entanglement that you are generating will actually grow as the ratio of the heavy mass divided by the light mass. And so that can be a very large amplification factor. And therefore, um, now we have the situation that we need to control two light masses. Those we have to place into the motional ground state, into coherent superpositions. And in addition, we just need to place a heavy mass in between that we do not need to cool to the motional ground state, but we have to cool it to maybe a few thousand phonons or so. And then it can actually act as an amplifier of gravitational interaction between the light test masses. And so that's really quite um, uh, promising um, because it now makes the, experiment, the effective interaction stronger, therefore the experiment shorter, and therefore moves this crazy experiment a slight to a, to, well, to a regime where it's slightly less crazy, still very challenging, but already many orders of magnitude lie easier than what, for example, Feynman was thinking. And so I think there will be an interplay here between improvements of experimental control and cleverer schemes of how to set up an experiment. And that will really give us the hope that maybe in 2030, 40, 50, such an experiment might become possible. But now I want to spend the last few minutes just making one clear, small remark. And namely, I've all the time been talking about we look for entanglement being built up between the test masses as a witness for the gravitational interaction being quantum mechanical. Well, do we really need to build up entanglement? Do we really need to look for entanglement to verify that gravity is quantum mechanical? And I would like to very briefly explain to you that actually this is not the case. We the, an experiment that never shows any entanglement ever between the two particles can, never, can nevertheless be used to verify the quantum character of the gravitational interaction. And um, so I, the, the paper that where we explained this is about 50 pages long. So I will give you the executive summary of, of the idea behind it. For the technical details, you will have to go through that uh, paper. Um, and so what, what is it actually that we are doing in all these experiments? Well, we are starting with two particles. We are doing something with one particle, changing it, placing it in a superposition. And we look how the other particle reacts to it. And therefore, what we are doing really is we are trying to establish a quantum channel between the left, hand, left particle and the right particle. And of course, quantum channels typically can create um, entanglement between the two bodies. 
And if we see entanglement, then we have verified that this channel is quantum mechanical. But imagine that we do something else. Um, let's say we create, we take the particle on the left and we prepare it in a certain quantum state. Take the particle on the right, we also prepare it in some quantum state. And then we wait a while. And if now after a while, these two quantum states have been interchanged. Yeah, so the particle B is now in state in the original state of particle A and vice versa. So that means we swap the quantum states. And if we can do this, if this happens, if we pick random initial states for both parties, then actually we also know that this can only happen if the channel that links the two particles is quantum mechanical, right? Because swapping the quantum state between two particles can has to, in principle, if these each of these particles would be entangled with some ancilla, could create actually um, entanglement by entanglement swapping. And therefore, this is not something that you can create by LOCC alone. And that's really the, the basic idea behind um, re, a, a revised test of quantum laws of gravity. Namely, we prepare the systems in some randomly chosen initial states. And we know what should happen if the interaction was gravitational. That means if the quantum channel, um, there would really be a quantum channel. Um, in that case, we would, get a, would expect a certain output state. And so at the end of the experiment, we test whether this output state is present or not. If the interaction is indeed gravitational, then we will always get the answer yes. So with probability one, we will get a particular measurement outcome. So that's great. But if the interaction is a channel that is created by local operations and classical communications, then what can we do? We have to make a measurement, some kind of measurement on the, on the initial state of the system. Then we transmit some by classical communication, some instructions, and then the final state is recreated. And um, in that case, we perturb the system, and therefore we expect that the fidelity will not be perfect. And indeed, this idea you can turn into really mathematics, and you can actually provide rigorous upper bounds on the uh, uh, fidelity of the states that you want to prepare, and in particular also on the maximum probability with which you determine, which with you will detect the outcome that you would expect from a gravitational interaction. And so now you can do an experiment and you just repeat it many times, you establish the probability statistics, and if the probabilities are sufficiently close to one, then you can actually rule out an, uh, a local operation and classical communications model for gravity. And, and now the interesting thing is that you can do this with harmonic oscillators and coherent states. So you prepare your harmonic oscillators initially in some displaced vacuum state, so they're coherent state. The interaction is extremely well described between those two particles by a, a, something that's equivalent to beam splitters. So that means that actually the, the dynamics, when it starts in coherent states, will never ever generate any entanglement. The, system, the two systems will always be in a product state. And so now um, we pick the uh, sufficiently many random initial states. We measure always the initial, we, we prepare an initial state, we measure the final state, and then we look at the fidelity that is achieved. And if it exceeds a certain value that we can derive as a bound rigorously, then we know the it's being gravitational, a uh, quantum mechanical. If it is below, we cannot say anything because maybe gravity is still um, quantum mechanical, but maybe there was too much noise in the system. But here we have now a situation where at no point in the experiment ever there was any entanglement. And nevertheless, we verify the quantumness of the channel that is linking the two experiments. So for let's say economy, quantum information expert, maybe this doesn't come as such a big surprise because um, when you, when you remember, for example, quantum cryptography, there are two schemes for quantum cryptography. One is the original scheme um, 
by, by Bennett, where they exchange um, via quantum channel particles, and there's never any entanglement involved. And then there's the other version, the entanglement-based version, which originally was actually proposed by David Deutsch in an early paper, but then uh, fleshed out further afterwards. And their entanglement is generated. And for a while, there were um, um, security proofs that were rather different for the Bennett scheme and the entanglement-based scheme. And then um, actually it was Sean Preskill who realized that these security proofs could be unified by noticing the fact that um, a channel, you can test whether it generates entanglement, but really you don't need to generate entanglement. You just need to be sure that the channel can have the propensity, the possibility of creating entanglement. And that you can probe by sending unknown quantum states to the channel and make sure that they appear on the other side, in this case, unperturbed. And so exactly it's something like this we are doing here as well. We are probing the channel sufficiently often with the product states. And if the channel is always giving us the correct result, the one that we desire, then we know that if we were have, would have sent one half of an entangled state through this channel, it would have also created entanglement. Okay, so in a nutshell, entanglement generation is not necessary to verify the, the quantum character of gravitational interaction. And this can actually have really important um, experimental consequences because some experiments that don't involve entangled states might be more robust than experiments that involve entangled states. And therefore, there now we have two routes towards these tests and that's um, always good. And now we have to see which one is the most promising one. Okay, and uh, with that, I would like to close because I've run out of time. Um, I had a few more slides, but I, I go to the uh, quickly past those. And, um, oops, sorry, that was too, uh, and, okay. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and the team um, here in Ulm that has contributed to this research, in particular, um, Julian Pedernales and Kirill Strelsov um, and, um, and uh, all the others. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kilenia, for the beautiful talk. Now it is time for discussion or questions. So it's open for discussion. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here you said that uh, since the two distant particles are being entangled, so we can say that the gravity acts like a channel and it is creating the entanglement, right? Yes. So since we know that there's this monogamy property of entanglement, uh, does it, can it mean that gravity can also have this type of monogamy property or how, how do you explain then this monogamy of entanglement? Um, of course, um... So if, if, if gravity is a quantum mechanical force, then it will generate entanglement. Then all the laws of entanglement that have been uh, determined, like, I mean, the monogamy, monogamy of entanglement, will, of course, also um, be seen here. Um, one particular place where you had seen the monogamy of entanglement actually implicitly, although I didn't state it like that, was here. Because what happens here is that... Um, Let's say at, at this time here, we are looking at the entanglement between these two light uh, test masses. Yeah? And we see there's no entanglement. Well, why is that? Because actually these two particles are also entangled with uh, the heavy test mass. And so you have a tripartite entanglement. And because you have this tripartite entanglement, you, when you trace out the heavy mass, you don't see any entanglement on the level of the test masses. Yeah. And so that's, in a way, it's a manifestation of the fact that you cannot uh, share uh, entanglement uh, indiscriminately between all these masses. And at this moment, the two, uh, at the time 2 pi here, there you see a strong entanglement between the test masses because they are not entangled anymore with a heavy mass. Yeah. But so, isn't it counterintuitive that gravity is not additive and it's 
it has a monogamy property if it is quantum at all mm. so Why? it means that if hmm? like if one uh, let's say if two uh, because in the field there can be many particles right so mm -hmm. uh, will not yep. it mean that if one is interacting with gravitationally with another particle mm -hmm. then the interaction cannot be that strong with other ones no the interaction can be strong also with other particles but then now the question is what state will be generated by this interaction and typically what will be generated will be a multi-particle entangled state where the correlations are distributed across all the particles and now if you would say oh and now i want to look only at two of them and then of course i trace out all the other ones and this typically destroys some of your observable entanglement yeah but so you have multi-particle entanglement now and okay. that's exactly this that's exactly the same that would happen if you take let's say charged particles several charged particles and you let them interact and there i mean we know i mean electromagnetic force is clearly a quantum force and we will get exactly the same behavior i mean we will get a multi-particle entangled state but if we look at only two part two particles of that state typically these will share very little observable entanglement exactly because of this monogamy yeah. mm -hmm. also one thing i wanted to ask without entanglement can you really certify that it is the gravity is quantum or if, if it doesn't satisfy any kind of non-locality thing or any violates any inequality can you really certify that gravity is quantum yes so in i mean that's i mean really the idea here is that i mean so what does it mean that gravity is quantum mechanical well it establishes a coherent quantum mechanical interaction between two particles and therefore a quantum channel yeah. so now we can test this quantum channel either by passing one half of an entangled state through it and see whether the entanglement arrives on the other side or we can probe this channel by feeding it randomly chosen quantum states and check whether they appear on the other side unchanged and uh, that would be one way of for example of testing whether a channel um, produces exactly the identity yeah. and so more generally when we say a channel is some we expect that a channel is some unitary then we can probe it by the way in which it transforms randomly chosen input states into output states and if it was an LOCC channel this fidelity would never be perfect, right? Um, while if it's a quantum channel, you can make, uh, you can produce exactly the uh, desired output state. And then so in that sense, it, you're using inequalities, but you're not using Bell inequalities. Yeah? So you're using, an, uh, you're using inequalities, uh, which basically bound the fidelity with which you observe the desired output state if gravity was quantum mechanical and if this inequality is violated then quantum mechanics is uh, gravity is not quantum mechanical but how do you know that there were no other interactions except of gravity exactly so this is a very good question that has to be made sure experimentally yeah and uh, this is this is really a very subtle um, uh, thing so we know fortunately we do know all the other forces in nature and we also know how their force laws are. So in fact, what we need to do is we need to make the separate the particles by a sufficiently large distance to make sure that, for example, the Casimir forces are negligible because they drop off like one to the, uh, uh, the distance to the seventh power. And we have to make sure that the particles are discharged, that they don't have dipole moments and, and so on. So this ex these experiments will not be just experiments where we look for entanglement or we look for having probed this quantum channel, we will also have to make experiments that rule out the presence of other quantum mechanical forces um, being present in the system. So only then this will be a really a conclusive test. And in fact, I mean, it becomes even more subtle. There's a part of the talk that I did not really um, um, come to, 
uh, which is uh, this one here. The, the point is, the problem is that we even have to test whether quantum mechanics at the level of heavy masses is still linear. So normally we say, okay, quantum mechanics is governed by the Schrodinger equation, which is a linear differential equation. And this has been tested for atomic degrees of freedom very well. But this actually has never been tested for heavy uh, masses that weigh maybe 10 to the minus 14 kilos or so. And if quantum mechanics is nonlinear, then actually we, in, a, in, a, in a recent paper, we have proven that then weak residual quantum mechanical forces might be strongly amplified to mimic gravitational interaction. And so we also have to test actually at the level of the masses that we are using for gravitational entanglement, we also have to test for those masses whether, whether quantum mechanics is still a linear theory. I mean, I believe it is, but we have to test it because it is also such that if you try and write down a theory of quantum gravity, then there are formulations which actually lead to nonlinear quantum mechanics, which is exactly the, um, uh, sorry, uh, if you write down a theory with where the gravitational field is classical and you try and preserve the quantum character of your masses, then actually it turns out that these theories typically become either noisy or nonlinear or both. And so these are the alternatives. So we have to actually rule out nonlinearity of quantum mechanics because only then we can really uh, use this, uh, this test of the quantum channel as a witness for the quantum mechanical character of gravity. So this is becoming actually quite subtle and it's in many senses, it will be probably a development just like in better inequalities where in the 1970s, um, there were the first experiments uh, that have just been awarded the Nobel Prize, which tested better inequalities, but truth to be told, these were not loophole free. So there were hidden, local hidden variable models that were not completely crazy that could explain these experiments. And then people over the next 50 years improved the experiments, refined them and refined them and refined them until actually in 20, I think 19 or so, the Ronald Hansen group in, in the Netherlands did an experiment where really everybody now agrees, okay, there are no sensible loopholes here anymore that can explain this experiment. And so therefore better inequalities have been, uh, have been violated and uh, we know that quantum mechanics is correct and uh, local invariable models are not. And I think uh, this was a long process and exactly the same will happen in these gravity test experiments. At the beginning, there will be experiments where people say, oh, well, but you know, there might be loopholes. Uh, and then gradually these experiments will be improved until everybody agrees that they're really conclusive. Uh, uh, yeah, because of time constraint, we cannot continue for, and we cannot take any more questions. So let us thank the speaker, Professor Plenio, for his beautiful talk. And 